Deuteronomy 8. It's about two hearts. The heart of the Father and the heart of our own. These two hearts can be observed most clearly in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. No, then in your heart, that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. I'd observe the parallel story of a father that disciplines his son, so does God disciplines you. It means to us that when God disciplines us, He's essentially saying that you are my son. Under what conditions did God discipline His children? Let's look at verses 3 and 4. It is when the Israelites need to be humbled. In other words, the Israelites were proud and God disciplined them. Our Heavenly Father isn't a tyrant, like a, a, a bad person. Who, who many misunderstands. So look at verses 3 and 4 again. On how God provided leadership, food, water, clothes, and health to them. So think for a moment, if you look into verses 3 and 4, think for a moment. After wondering for 40 years that your clothes never worn out, neither do your feet ever swell. Right. You can also see in verses 7 and 8 about the abundantly good things that God has prepared for them, for His children. Hence, our Heavenly Father isn't a tyrant. He disciplines and He means well. So that's our Father's heart. How about our heart? Being disciplined is part of being a child of God. Discipline is unpleasant, but we must understand how to appreciate it because it is essential that we learn and remember the ways of our Lord, your God. Our heart needs to know and remember. Look at the warning in verse 14. That our hearts can be proud and forget. So it's important for us to know why we are disciplined. Because we live in a world that celebrates evil. Take Halloween for example. It is a pagan worship. Okay? So without discipline of God, many Christians will fall into this form of pagan worship. There's a, generation for, there's a message for my generation. Okay. A people who are well connected and have access to a wealth of knowledge on the internet. And this tends to cause us to think we know it better. And our hearts become proud. And we need to be careful not to follow the trends of the world. And just to mention a few trends, happening in churches that are breaking the father's heart. Dishonoring parents, gossiping, homosexuality, laziness, the love of money, sex outside of marriage, and the worship of self. The truth is that our hearts are not aligned with the father's heart because we are not familiar with the Bible. The truth is this, the time we have spent on media consumption within the year, could easily translate to the time completing the Bible. Our hearts need to be ready for discipline. Discipline is inevitable. As long as we live in this imperfect world as a child of God, discipline will come. Unpleasant as it may be, baby, our hearts need to know that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. So my point here is this. Our Father's heart is love and our, our hearts is need. We need to respond in humility and accept the mistake. Learn and be careful not to repeat it again. If your life isn't disciplined, check again. Are you living as a child of God? Are you too proud to appreciate the discipline? Or are we too numb that the dis discipline that is happening in your life, you cannot feel? So with this, I close and I hand the time to our senior pastor, Philip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please turn to chapter 8 of Deuteronomy.
I'll do three things today. First of all, I want to read to you what Deuteronomy chapter 8 says. Uh, the key ideas have already been given to us just now. And then I want to talk about um, the outline. I'll run through it quickly. Then I'm going to show you some pictures. All right. The pictures will be a reward for you when you pay attention. So, we are preparing for our anniversary very soon. And uh, at every anniversary, it's a time for renewal. Renewal of our covenant. And when you do so, you see a new level of God's power and blessing upon your life. So, Father, we just come as we have just sung, Lord. You are so, so good to each one of us. And we know, Lord, it comes out of your goodness. And surely, goodness and mercy has followed us all the days of our lives. So we exalt you this morning. We, ex uh, we thank you too, Holy Spirit, that you are our teacher this morning. You speak to us, reveal to us, wonderful things out of your holy word. We humble our hearts this morning that we might learn, learn just as our Lord Jesus was a learner. We want to be an effective learner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> First exercise uh, is, uh, I'd like you to open your Bibles and I'm going to take you quickly <clears throat> <clears throat> through this passage, it's a very short passage, and uh, because the Word of God is powerful, it's even more important than what I have to say. So, let's look at it. Verse 8, uh, uh, verse 1, chapter 8. <clears throat> if you got it, open your Bible. If you got a pen, mark it as I have marked. I don't know what kind of marking you put. Uh, but uh, this is my marking. I taught you about meditation. <clears throat> I put my marking on the margin, and I mark key verses. This is how I do it. Do it the best you can. First one. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. <clears throat> Action word, what? Go in and possess the land. Observe. That speaks of your purpose. So I put this as commandment number one. Go in and possess the land. That's what the Lord wants to do. Because he said, this land is what the Lord has sworn to give to your father Abraham so, and his descendants. You are the descendants. I want you to take possession of your gift. Verse 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you in all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you and to know, to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. So this is an attribute of God. God is a leader. He leads us. He leads us all the way. He leads us for 40 years, these people. But God leads. That's one of his things he likes to do. God always leads you. Okay, so that can be a... a <clears throat> just a character of God he leads so don't be shy to ask for leading the other key word is I underline uh, mark is the word test the word test is a key word in this passage <clears throat> and he'll tell us how he's going to test us and the purpose is that we may know his heart so I put this test number one no your heart. So it's called a heart test. Test of the heart. So this is something God wants to do. 
So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manner which you did not know, and nor did your fathers know that he might make you that he may make you know. Make you know. That would be a key phrase here. Underline that. God wants to make us know. And I think God is a hard time making us know because we don't pay attention most of the time. I just wonder, one of the things God wants to make us know that is that He loves us. He's trying to make us know. That the word speaks of His trying His best. And I wonder whether He's able to convince you that He wants to make you know one thing. That man shall not live by bread alone, but but. Man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I call this what God wants to do. Every word is what He wants us to get hold of. Not just look for bread. Not just figure food, but spiritual. Verse 4, your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. I call this God's attribute because <clears throat> this is his protection. It's miraculous to wear the same dress 40 years and the color never faded. This kind of quality you cannot buy anymore. Uh, and your legs never get swollen. <clears throat> that is so important. You can move around. Verse 5 is my key phrase first for this whole uh, session. Actually, uh, uh, I'm going to focus on this. You, shall, you should know this one thing God wants us to know. Don't be ignorant in your heart, not just in your head, that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. This is uh, chasten means discipline. I call it God's attribute because... He's in a business of disciplining us. I think this is the unpleasant part of his work, but it is necessary for our own good. Verse 6, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. This is our part in the discipline. For the Lord your God is bringing you, underline the word bringing, he likes to bring us, holding us by the hand, <clears throat> into a good land, not a bad land. A land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs uh, that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. <clears throat> a land of olive oil. That's very healthy food. A land in which uh, you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron, and out of those hills you can dig copper. These are building materials. You need both for virtually every equipment <clears throat> that you ever make. When you have eaten our food, then you shall bless the Lord. This is what you need to do. This is commandment number four. You shall bless the Lord just like what you did this morning. Why? <clears throat> bless him for the good land which he has given you. He has given. This is has given. Not just a promise. You know that your inheritance has been given. Verse 11, beware that you do not forget. <clears throat> I call this S. It's a warning. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His judgments, His statutes, which I command you today. These commandments are God's commandments, not Moses' commandment. Verse 12, last, so that you can avoid one thing. And the word when 
There are four whens that follow because not if, it is when. Okay? Underline the word when. It's not if. It's when you have eaten and are full. This means it is going to happen, it will happen, you will eat and be full. And have built beautiful homes and dwell in them. And when this is going to happen in the days ahead. When your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, this is when God multiplies your wealth, silver and gold and uh, flocks and herds. This is also a measurement of wealth. Verse 14, when, again, when your heart is lifted up, so it's not if your heart is lifted up. Your heart is going to be lifted up. When your heart is lifted up and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from slavery, from the house of bondage, so you forget where you come from. For you forgot that once you were in bad shape and God has brought you. When all these things happen, you forget who? God who led you through that great and terrible wilderness. You even forget your disciplines. And the thirsty land where there is no water. God who brought water for you out of a flinty rock. Who? You forget who? The Lord who led you. Forget who? The Lord who fed you. He led and he fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you. That's the key word here. He wants to humble you because we tend to be proud. So that what? And that he might test you. Again, the word test. Underline the word test. The word test. God is a tester. That's why I put here A, attribute. Tested to do in order to do good in the end. So God is concerned about our end. God begins with the end in mind. That your end will be well. Guaranteed only by God. If you understand what and why he's testing your heart. Verse 17. Then you say in your heart when you, you, <clears throat> when you are full and you forget. Then you say. And God listens to what you say in your heart. This is not say out. You didn't verbalize it. You say in your heart. All of us say a lot of things in our hearts. And what you say in your hearts is what God hears. All right? What you say in your heart is what God hears. My power and the might of my hand have gained me the wealth. What wealth? This wealth. Cattle and flock, silver and gold. <clears throat> all the multiplied wealth, houses, and so on. My power, underline the word my, that's sin. All right, when you see it's yours, <clears throat> it will come, you will say, my power have gained me this wealth. That means, this wealth means it's already in your hands. Check what wealth you have right now. You got more than anyone else in other parts of the world. BBC's report is that Singapore is one of the wealthiest nations in the world. I know you say, where is it? Check it yourself. Verse 18, and you shall remember the Lord. And when that happens, you must do one thing. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. What's the purpose of giving you wealth? Is to establish a covenant he made with your forefathers, Abraham. <clears throat> As it is this day, so it's happening today. Then it shall be, this is what's going to be the end. If you forget, okay, if you forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you will surely, underline the word surely, 
surely perish. Twice, God says, you will surely perish. As the nations which the Lord your God destroys before you, so you shall perish because you will not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. So I underline the two words, perish, because this is the sure end if we forget. So that's a quick rundown. That's what God says. Now, for 10 minutes, I'm going to run down your notes. Okay, all of you got these notes. Please turn to it. And I will attach what you learned from these notes to what you have learned from this passage. Why is it so wonderful? All right. So I'm going to read these notes with you before I show you some pictures. Open your notes and you can underline your notes uh, as we go along. So today I'm talking about what? Heart testings and covenant confirmation or covenant renewal. That's what the Word of God says, that the testing of our hearts is for the purpose of covenant confirmation or covenant renewal. That's what we're going to do on the 30th anniversary two weeks from now. So there must be testings. <clears throat> um, the key word here in this note is that in order for you to purpose to know your heart, because you don't even know your own heart, says the prophet Jeremiah, <clears throat> Because the heart of man is desperately wicked. You don't even know it. Only the Holy Spirit knows it and he reveals it. <clears throat> so we are preparing for our 30th anniversary. You are the new generation that has emerged. Every new generation needs to reestablish their own identity as a people of God through covenant renewal. So how do we do this? is the heart of today's message. In times of visualizing change, this is something you need to know. You, I'm now speaking to you as a new generation. That change is taking place and the change you need to also take place in our hearts. How do we learn from our old ways and seize new opportunities. In times of transition, which we are right now in, you don't realize what a rapid transition is taking place in our world today. I wish I got more time to explain to you what's behind the Israeli war today. Uh, what's happening? Uh, what's this uh, warning to us? Uh, what's gonna be coming in the next 10 years? Uh, you don't realize what a rapid and drastic change is now taking this year, <clears throat> which is the year of Jubilee, 50 years year from the last war of 1973. And I was there. 50 years have passed. <clears throat> I wish I got more time to explain, maybe another time about the change that's gonna take place. So we are in transition. <clears throat> so in this transition, what questions arise? So the book of Deuteronomy gives answers to questions of change. All right? This answers questions of change. By looking into the pattern of covenant renewal, that will be your protection. So covenant renewal is a constant theme throughout Scripture. But uh, uh, so... Uh, <clears throat> covenant renewal involves a recall of covenant history. So you need to know what are the covenant history because we learn from history. There are a lot of things that happening now is a repetition of history. Especially history you have learned as from the last four books. Things like the year of Jubilee. With that, you can predict what's going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> Then the response sought by God is loyalty to Him, that you love Him. That's all He's asking for. 
So he calls us to examine our hearts today and then examine his hearts as well. Is there love and obedience to him and his commands? That will be the essence of the, the examination. In covenant renewal, the Lord urged upon his people the need to make a clear choice. So it's about decision making that we are talking about. The objective in this is overcoming double mindedness. You know, we are so double minded, we don't even realize that. And God wants to help us to serve the Lord and no other. Covenant renewal makes clear his claim over our lives and that he will not accept half hearted service. So that is God's terms. Then we're going to look into know the heart of God. <clears throat> now, from verse 1 just now we read, I don't know whether you pick up this. We are now looking at first part called observations from the Word of God. From verse 1 we have just read, you should pick up one observation that God's intentions are good. How do you know? Because he desires, he said, you must be careful to what? To observe. So that, and then you must be careful to go in and take possession of the land. Isn't that good? God gives a gift and he wants to make sure we get it and not the devil take away from us. God's intentions are always good. From Genesis, from, from Deuteronomy 1, verse 21, God says, I've set the land before you. Go in and possess it. And God says, one thing you must, as you possess it, as the Lord your God of your fathers have spoken to you, have said to you, fear not. Be not discouraged. Why? He gives us a clue. Fear and discouragement will rob us of our strength to take hold of our inheritance. God said, I've already said it before you. It's like a dinner. I've already set the table. All the food is present now. Can you come and enjoy it? Come and enjoy it. Uh, enjoying the food, I cannot do it for you. You have to do it yourself. These are all intentional. Know the Father's heart. But before we talk about um, further on, we need to test the Father's heart in a way. But he reveals it to us. We, God wants to reveal his heart to us, but we have to test our hearts. Now, we talk about testing. Why? You know, anything you want to know about reliability, you must test. Do you know that every engine put onto your aircraft when it's repaired must be tested to full power, stress to maximum. No engine can ever be put on a flight without a test. So it's a reliability. But when God wants us to know his heart, he wants to tell us that, hey, look at this history, what I've done, and what I say, can I, can you trust me? I'm reliable, 100%. So testing is both sides. God say, come and test me. Look at what I've done. And what does he say? Why is he good? He wants us to progress the land. In this passage, for Israel, it's the land of Canaan, to possess it as their inheritance. But for us, our inheritance includes what? Eternal life, abundant life, spiritual authority. Hey, that's very important. If you've got no authority, nobody listens to you. And the devil certainly won't listen to you. All spiritual blessings, God declared in Ephesians that all spiritual blessing has been given. Most of us don't even realize it. That's your inheritance. All spiritual blessing, that means blessing in the spiritual realm, the things that cause your spirit to rise up, to full of joy, full of victory, it's given. Ephesians chapter 1 says so. His presence, fullness of joy, His peace, His love, and the place He has prepared for us. Jesus said, I have prepared, I'm preparing a place for you. And I'll bring you, I'll lead you to the place I have prepared for you. This would be future. Now, 
Here in this verse 4, God expresses love by His care and discipline. So, His care, your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell up for 40 years. You know, to have strong feet and legs are very important. You can enjoy yourself, you can go where you want. You know, feet are weak and you cannot walk, you are nothing much you can do. You can't go where you want. But this speaks of his care, okay? This mainly his care. He, care. he watches over 40 years. How come clothes cannot wear out? Another passage says their shoes do not wear out, their legs do not wear out. By the way, they wore shoes uh, and didn't wear out. So they only have one pair. How many pair of shoes do you all keep? Why? Because they wear out, right? But here it doesn't. He cares. And then that's to do with our health. He cares for your health. He cares for your health. That's why 40 years, verse 4, that's what it means. All right. Can you make all these observations so that then I'll go make some application? But verse 5 also says He disciplines us. Know that in your heart a man just know in your heart, not just in your head. In your head, you say, yeah, 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 I think I know, but it's in your heart you recognize deep down that it is that a man, as God disciplines us, is as a man disciplines his son, or as a mother disciplines his son. You know how wonderful this is? That you have a father. You know, when you are disciplined, you have a father. Every one of us need a father, including that you are not orphans. Some of you may be orphans, but God says, I'm your father. In the church, Paul said, you may have many teachers, but you have very few fathers. I, Paul, am your father. Wow, what a wonderful thing. You know, my... my spiritual father, Dr. Benjamin Chiu, coached me as a young leader. I was 30 years old. I became a church leader, and he was my coach. And he acted like a father to me. I live in his home. I watch what kind of music he enjoys. Uh, he's, he likes classical music. I, I only grew up in Kampong. I go for, in those days, called Bill Haley, uh, Nate King Cole, uh, uh, rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Uh, I'm in a Kampong. We all dance Elvis Presley. Uh, we behave like Elvis Presley. We comb our hair like Elvis Presley, especially one Indian friend of mine. He, is, he won the prize. His hair goes like that. God's comb. Oh, we're all Elvis Presley's worshipper. But with Dr. Chu, I learned about what is Moonlight Sonata. <laughs> I didn't know what is. Yeah, when I first heard, I thought it's something from the moon. <laughs> but uh, I, I begin to see, wow, he got good ha hobbies. He was an expert tennis player. And uh, he, um, he, 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 he uh, never quotes names, but actually, he's one of his friends who learned from him is Benjamin Shears. Uh, they were classmates. But I begin to see, oh, his hobby. He, when I live in his home, I saw everybody play Scrabble. Wow, you know, you all must teach Scrabble. I want to just bring Scrabble. My wife said, ah, yeah, that's a bit out of date. Hey, but I learned all English from them. I learned strange words like zo and so on, you know. And I begin to see how he lived. And uh, he would be up at 3 a.m. in the morning and he would study the word. And I could see he enjoys learning languages. He reads his Bible in Greek. And so I said, I just want to read in Greek. Uh, and uh, then he uh, lives well. He got a sense of good, what is good music, what is good art. But wow, I really learned uh, as a kampong kid, you know. I never got all this. Many years after he passed away, 
I still dream about Dr. Benjamin Chiu. And I said, hey, doc. Then I woke up and realized, hey, he passed away 15 years ago. <laughs> Why? Everyone have a heart. You need a father. And God says to you, you're not an orphan. Don't say you're an orphan. I'm your father. You need a father. No matter how old you are, you need a father. Love your father. Appreciate your father. Why, why is a father more important than a teacher? Because a father takes care of you from young. When you know nothing, zero, zero, he teaches you from basic right up. He takes care of you. He makes provision for you. Before you face a danger, he already thought about it. He trains you. He disciplines you. But, you know, it's all for your own good. That's what a father is. God says, can you recognize that every discipline I put you through is for your own good because I'm your father. You are not an orphan. Come to the Father. So our Lord Jesus, when you go up to the New Testament, when you pray, call Father. Don't pray, oh Jesus, call Father. You are my Father. I'm coming to a Father as your kid. And I know you care for me because you are my Father. No Father say, get lost kid, I don't know who you are. No. Father say, come son. What is it you want? And uh, sometimes you ask for outrageous things, but the father will listen to you. If it's your boss, you say, tomorrow you don't have to come. But your father will never say that. So understand what this term is. As a father disciplines his son, the NIV says, as a father disciplines his son. It's a father-son relationship. By the way, the word son is not about it's not a gender word, sisters. That includes you. Uh, and father includes mothers. We all need fathers. Sometimes you may not realize it, that I'm an adult, 70 years old, I was, could dream that, hey, I wish I could meet my father. My own father was a seaman, but the one who taught me the things of God was this man. You need a father. God's training is for a good future. Unlike punishment, which is penalty for past failures. The father does not punish us just as a penalty. Take note, underline this word. There's a difference between penalty and uh, a good future. Punishment is about penalty. But uh, disciplines is about a good future. That's the biggest difference. God has a good end in mind for each one of us. That comes from the heart of a father. God is preparing the heart of his people to qualify them, underline this word, to stay in a promised land. Because God may promise to give you everything, but you may not be able to stay in it. You may not be able to enjoy it even though it's given to you because you don't know how to enjoy it. Then, by, this, by the way, our inheritance is not just in eternity, but here and now. That's why we sang the song, you are so good. All my life, you have been faithful. If you can sing that from your heart, you are a blessed people. There will be consequences of sin in this discipline if we reject it. The first generation refused, underline that word, and they never got into the inheritance. They died in the wilderness. So it's recorded to teach us the new generation. I'm now speaking to you as a new generation because 30 years have passed. I'm speaking particularly to you young people who are collegiates, who are youth. I want you to know that I'm here as a servant, not as your boss. I'm here as your servant. Then from verse 7 to 9, which you have just read, these are the observations you should have already made. He gives good quality gifts, no secondhand stuff, no cheapskate, no useless, 
no, uh, nothing that is of low value. Do you realize that God doesn't give you low value gifts? It's always very expensive gifts. It's because you don't realize it. Many of you sisters, you don't realize how pretty you are because pretty girls always think they are very ugly. Ask those sin, uh, film stars, are you beautiful? They say, no, I think I'm very ugly. Even your good looks, you never appreciate it. That's a good gift. Every morning you stare in the mirror and you say, please don't say, how come God got a sense of humor? He made my face like that. Huh? No, you are the one who made your face like that. Uh, don't say, God never say, hey, your face needs some ironing. <laughs> no, he gives you a wonderful face. When there is joy in your heart, you have a beautiful face. But his gifts are good quality, high quality, never cheap stuff. Trouble is, find out what it is. Nothing lacking is a key word you need to know about his gifts is always nothing lacking, nothing always in abundance because he wants us to enjoy the abundance that he's giving us. Please understand that Father always, when he gives a gift to the child, he wants them to learn how to enjoy it. Otherwise, his effort is all wasted. When I give a good gift to my kids, I don't want the day will come and they waste it and give it away. So there are few things God gives. I put in under the word rich. God's rich gifts. Uh, God describes it. A land that is what? With refreshing springs. It's iron and copper. You know, that is for you to make whatever you want to make. By the way, they knew about making steel and copper and uh, long, long before. 6,000 years ago is not a recent discovery. There is culinary delights. All right, you, you check the kind of food God cooks. You know, it's about uh, uh, figs, vines, pomegranates. You check the food on, on uh, uh, what we call uh, food value. They have numbers for it. And uh, uh, antioxidant value or oxytin value, you'll find that the foods here are very high value. Pomegranates rank one of the highest. Uh, actually, the highest is cloves, but they are all in a good classification. Fix. If you are eating this kind of food regularly, instead of eating chak wei tiao, uh, you'll be very healthy. Okay? You'll not be over, overweight or skinny. Uh, try to eat this kind of foods, all right? And then he says there's no scarcity and so on. Foods in abundance, no lack at all. That's God's purpose. Herds and flocks are the measure of wealth. Silver and gold, wealth. God never intended any Christian to be poor as a beggar. No food to eat. No, uh, no, no, uh, no, not enough money to pay bills. That is not your destiny. Please note that. If that's a situation, you are jobless, you are, can't even uh, pay for the bills, take note, there's a discipline that's taking place. You need to get back to the Lord. Then he wants us to, fifth thing is to understand his true motives from a father's heart. It's, it's because of his father's love. It's always for our good. It is for us to take possession of our inheritance underline these four things, three things. His love, our good, and our inheritance. Second thing you need to know is to test your own heart if you want to know the condition. Uh, don't tell me, oh, I know my heart. Folks, the Word of God says you don't know your heart. You don't know how deceitful your heart is. And unless you start from this point, you'll never learn. What is the condition of your heart? So, what's preventing us from enjoying 
the stuff that God has prepared for us. The first thing is that we um, we need to go for four major tests. What you have just read is four major tests. You always, every one of us have to go through, no exceptions. All right, it's something like PSLE. Now I think they are trying to cancel PSLE. I think that's a bad move. Why? Because you, if you are untested, how do you know? You need to be tested. You see, you are, you are confident, you walk with God. How do you know? You need to be tested in four areas. I call it hope. This test will give you hope for the future. Number one test is called a hunger test. Uh, hunger, I know some of you sitting here are saying, dinner, uh, lunchtime coming, I'm under hunger test. Hey, uh, please, uh, it's only not yet 11 o'clock. But the hunger test is a physical test to show whether I'm more hungry for God's word than physical food. It's about my appetite test. What matters most? This is a value test. Underline the word. Because your values regarding good food and God's word cannot be compared. In other words, do you, can you tell me, do you value reading God's word more than your breakfast? Oh, lunchtime coming. Oh, I must eat. Oh, my kid is hungry. Maybe your kid also needs to learn something about controlling your appetite. Once in a while, it's, it's good for them. That the Word of God is more important to you than the physical food, than good food. Is that the value? This only you can tell yourself. You, would you skip lunch one day in a week to read God's Word? Well, that will be a good test. Then, our Lord Jesus demonstrated this, that when he was after 40 days fast, of course he was hungry. I know some of you, two hours already you are hungry. But here is 40 days. Jesus was really, really hungry. And the devil's question is about turning stones into food. But the Lord's answer, he goes back to this verse. Verse 4 or verse 3. Jesus goes back to this verse. You see, even the Lord Jesus subject himself to his own word here. And Jesus replied to the devil, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, some of you would probably agree partially only, right? You would say not every word, only just some of the words. But God says every word. Because every word... If you can master it, you have the same authority as Jesus. Because Jesus quoted this verse of the relevant word, and the devil never say, oh, you're wrong. The devil never fights the word of God. So, this is a comparison here. If you have a diamond workman, you keep even the broken chips of diamonds because they are high value. Make words of God of high value to you. Then you will begin to see high value inheritance in your life. Obedience test is the second one. Will you keep every commandment or not? This commandment is to test, not value test, but will you do obedience test? That means, will you keep the commandments? God wants to test us whether you keep God's commandments when it's convenient or when it is uh, all the time. When it's difficult, you still keep it. Somebody asked me yesterday in my small group, uh, is, do we have to keep the old ten, ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments given in this book, Deuteronomy. I said, okay, let's look at the Ten Commandments. The first one, no other gods, must we keep this? He said, yes. Second one, no idols, must we keep it? He said, yes. Number three, don't use vulgar language and use God's name for swearing. Is it correct? You must keep it? He said, yes. Uh, fourth one, must keep the Sabbath or not? He said, yes. Then we go down the line. Can you keep, commit adultery or not? He said, cannot. Then can you lie or not? Cannot. Everything cannot. So must you keep, you tell me. He said, oh, it makes sense. I think we better keep it. If we don't keep it, the government will catch us. 
Third, the pride test. Wow, this is the biggest one. Pride test is the hardest test to pass. Because Jesus himself already said that everyone without exception will, will fall sometime or other under the pride test because you'll be offended. Nobody can uh, uh, escape offense. Sometime or other, somebody says something to you and you got offended. Some people are so easily offended if you say, good morning, you say, what's so good about the morning? See, you say good morning, so he gets offended. You don't say, he says, why are your face so black? So people, I know you're not as bad as that, but what Jesus said is, pride test is one of the hardest to pass. So he says, God hears the, these words which you say in your heart, because pride comes from the heart. So the moment the heart says something, God hears it. It's all recorded, by the way. Uh, he said, uh, but I never say it, what? I never come out, what? Yeah. God has got an instrument that puts, it's put here. He records it first. And then God says, if you say in your heart that it's my power, my strength, my hands, my, 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 who gain wealth, you are going to get disciplined. That's why we always declare, Lord, this wealth is from you. Please show me how to use it. I'm only a custodian. I did not get the wealth myself. Singapore is the wealthiest city in the world, according to uh, some world measurements. But... Don't ever say, we Singaporeans are so smart. Hey, when you start talking like that, we soon find that our wealth will be gone. All right. What anecdote to pride in times of plenty? When you have eaten and satisfied, praise the Lord. In other words, when we are full, our stomachs are full, we are bound to react in one or two ways. So God says, before you make any mistakes, what is you need to do. The first thing you do when you see goodness in your life, when you see wealth coming in, you see big package, some of you are better paid than uh, you may not realize it. I know some of you who are making 10000 a month, you think it's still small salary. Let me tell you uh, from a business angle, uh, to give you 10000 a month, you need to make at least 100000 profit before the boss can give you 10,000. It's big salary, but we, we never thank God. And we, so it says here, the moment you get any wealth, the first thing you need to get in a habit of doing is give praise to the Lord. I say, Lord, I praise you because of your generosity. It is you who have given me the ability to gain wealth. That is the next verse. Remember, there are two verses here you must never, you must memorize. This next verse that says, you shall remember verse 18. Why 18 is very easy to remember. This is chapter 8, verse 18. In Cantonese, how you say? Fat, yao fat. Fa, you fa. Wow, this is, you really got rich. Now you get richer. Now, Kenshin uh, can speaks Cantonese. How you say it? Ah, you say fat, yao fat. That's the correct pronunciation. Uh, can these people believe in this? Hey, but it comes from the Bible. 818, okay? God says, memorize this verse. That it is God who gives you the ability to get wealth. That's the first thing. That's how you bless God. How do you else you bless God? Your offerings. Don't only mouth say, hey, thank you, thank you. Well, yeah, yeah, I know God gives it to us. Hey, when you make an offering, that is an expression that, Lord, I'm only giving back to you what you have given me. Uh, you see, if I give God back 10%, maybe he, he'll multiply it and give me some more. Hey, uh, 
some uh, preachers say, hey, you must give more. Uh, you know, the more give, uh, you give, God will multiply some more to you, you know. Hey, this is a very good uh, uh, investment, you know. You put more, you get more. That may be true, but that's not the motive of your giving. It is an appreciation of God's generosity, not in anticipation of more wealth. Just remember, the more wealth will come as part of God's inheritance to you. But don't be calculative and say, well, hey, you give some more, you get more. That's not the direction of the giving. So you first thing, learn to praise the Lord. Learn to give in praise to Him. In worship is what you can do. And be careful not to forget the Lord. And you observe His commandments. When you do this, take an effort to obey the commandments of God, then you will be able to overcome the hard setbacks of this uh, test of the heart for pride. When we build, you see, one of the biggest problems I find among Christians who have enjoyed great wealth from the Lord is this. They transfer their allegiance and love for God to the gift. We are more interested in the gift than the giver. The moment that happens, that gift becomes a God. And the name of that God is called Mammon. Is it just a concept? No, Jesus sees it as a very concrete thing. That this money has now transferred into, transformed into a God. And now you are worshipping at this altar of wealth, the God of wealth. Only in the whole world, only Singapore got the word God of wealth. We call it Chai Shen Ye. Is that correct? That's a foolish thing to do. But everybody, when they put a huge uh, picture of an old man with beard and uh, old uh, garments, people go there and pie, 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 pie. You know, God of wealth, I can do, I get more wealth. I haven't heard of anybody who got more wealth after they do that. It's a foolish and not only foolish, God get very angry. When you go to the God of wealth, because there's only one God who gives you wealth. That's what it says right here. It is God that gives you the power to get wealth. That means to get wealth, you need power, spiritual power. And then that comes. And you must understand why God gives you this wealth. It says the reason for giving you this wealth is what? As a confirmation of the covenant that he has made between him and Abraham. The covenant that we now enter into by faith in Christ. What was the covenant God gave to Abraham? That you have a great name, that you have a great nation. And of course, uh, it involves great wealth. And Abraham became one of the richest men in the country. He had an 318 male employees. 318. Then plus other female employees, you can double the number 600. That's uh, 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 what in army we call brigade size. Uh, that's why he could take 318 out to do the fighting. And uh, so the question is, take note of this. It's normal in our culture to take things for granted. God's word explained that it's because of our foolish hearts are darkened. Romans 1 says so. That we take things for granted because of a foolish heart that has been darkened by sin. Then you will not be grateful. That's God's explanation why we are ungrateful people. And so you want to teach your kids about gratitude then you have to recognize this. That is because our hearts remain foolish. It did not have the input of God's wisdom. And then on top of that, our hearts are darkened by sin. And therefore, we naturally will not give thanks. 
we may say thank you, but we are not very grateful. The last test is called the ending test. The ending test is where you go at the end of the journey. And uh, it says here, God's purpose end is a good end so that your end will be good, it will be well with you. Again and again, God says, it will be well with you. Every time he talks about obeying his commandments, he says, it will be well with you. In, all the way from Deuteronomy 1, uh, you see, Deuteronomy 2 says, the Lord has blessed you in all the works of your hands. He knows you're walking through a great wilderness 40 years. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. That was the conclusion in chapter 2, verse 7. Then in chapter 5, uh, verse 29, God again re repeats his ending. He says, you know, God says about his heart. Every time he, when the verse begins with the word, oh, God is just opening up his heart to us. Oh, that my my people will, oh, that there's such a heart in them that they will fear me and keep all my commandments always. For it will be well with them and their children forever. Can you see that? Chapter 5, verse 29. We covered this several weeks ago. Because I wish all of you will have this heart to fear me, to reverence me, to respect me, honor me. Because I bless you in verse 2, 7. He said, I bless you in all the works of your hands. But in verse 5, he reveals his heart. And we talk about chapter 7 again. Chapter 6, we talk about uh, good things. Then chapter 7, we have God reiterated in clear statement that God says, for you are a holy people, uh, uh, and, 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 and the Lord your God has chosen you especially to be a special people unto himself and I we say a treasured people that you be a special people unto himself that God has chosen you and he says further in chapter 7 verse 7 and 8 he says and the Lord did not love did, did not choose you uh, uh, because you are greater in number than anyone else, for you are fewest among the people. But because the Lord loved you, He declared openly, uh, the Lord loved you. That's why the book of Deuteronomy is a book on love. In all the books that talks about love, of course, Psalm talks about love. Of course, Proverbs talk about love. Song, uh, Song of Songs is a love story. But other than the book of John talks about love, but rang among all the Old Testament books, Deuteronomy has more words on love than any other book. So it's a book on love. And so the word of God says, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep his covenant, which he swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that he has set you free from the house of bondage and uh, out of the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Who is king of Pharaoh? In our modern time will be the one who wants to control us, none other than the devil himself. God had already set us free from his bondage. So again and again, now chapter 8, God repeats it again another way. I think God has a hard time convincing us that He loves us. You are talking now chapter 8. I still don't know even whether you realize God loves you. And so, in closing, since you pay good attention, I'm now going to show you some pictures. I'm going to sum up everything in three pictures. The first thing, the way to follow this is uh, clockwise. Okay. Let me see whether I can put it all in. All right. You need this picture, get it from your net leader. All right, so I put it. This sums up the first few 
verses. It's about know God's heart. All right. I just explained to you from the Word of God. I want you to know it's from God's Word. So the question here is why He disciplines us. So I take the first part. Firstly, it goes this way, all right? You follow this way. This is the heart of God, heart of love. Why does He discipline us? Because He wants us to possess our inheritance. Verse 1. So that what He has given us will not be taken away by the devil. So why does He want us to? Oh, well, what kind of inheritance is this? Then the Word of God says, uh, why, why does He discipline us? Basically, He prepares our hearts to receive His good gifts, right? So what are the good gifts? It, in order to receive these good gifts, you need to qualify. So the discipline, why He disciplines us, is to qualify us by keeping and but when we keep every commandment, we need to qualify for this inheritance. In, for qualify uh, in order to take possession, they qualify us to make us, uh, uh, enable us to take hold of his possessions. Now, the, then it tells us about what kind of, how good are the good gifts. Example of good quality resource rich gifts like for instance refreshing springs you know every time you read the word you need to go back to this period this is 3,500 years ago agriculture was a main uh, income uh, money making uh, area so you need refreshing springs farmland is useless without water so you have refreshing springs. You've got tasty food every season, pomegranates, figs, healthy food, tasty food. Oil and honey is special. It's the cream in over the cake because olive oil is one of the healthiest. Take a spoon every day. You'll find that your system will work very well. Honey is also very medicinal, but very tasty, very uh, enriching. And... Uh, then we have got abundance. God says you'll have f carbohydrates which are very healthy. Okay, barley and uh, wheat up in abundance and many more. I just give you four. Four. And uh, so they're all good quality stuff. And uh, everyone who lives during this period cannot do without this to have a healthy life. Now, the second branch you look at it is this. Why does he discipline us? When he does so, he is an act of love. If an act of love of a father, not a love of a teacher, not a love of a, a government, it's the love of the um, heavenly father. So it's an act of love. Why does he discipline us? It's for our own good. All right, so this morning we sang, all my life, you have been faithful. And why? Because he's so good to us and we don't realize. And what else is he trying to do? He'll make us humble. The why he has to discipline us so that we remain humble. When you remain humble, you have got grace in abundance. God resists the proud and gives grace only to the humble. All right, this sums up why he disciplines us. The second part I want you to cover is know our hearts. We have covered this just now. Let me sum it up with this picture. He knows our hearts. We need to know our hearts through testing of hope. First, hope stands for hunger test. is to develop your appetite for His Word. That's why you need a hunger test. Second, you need an obedience test. What is the obedience test? It is, uh, this first one is a test for our value. This one is a training for our decision-making powers so that we will always make the right choice that is in obedience to God. We will not be suffering from fear of man and then get uh, intimidated. 
So this is all about our heart stairs. And uh, the making of this decision, it says here, when we stay inside the circle of his blessings, that's why obedience test is so important. Then the next heart test is to uh, the pride test is to recognize the source of all your goodness and wealth so that you do not say that you are the one who gained wealth and you don't become boastful. This is pride test. This is a biggie. But you learn to thank God. You know, we all serve God our heart of gratitude. Not because we must, but because of gratitude. The last test I talk about is the ending test. He wants us to have a good end. Therefore, uh, this is a treasure test that we treasure God's covenant blessing. That's why two weeks' time we want to do a covenant renewal. Ending test, wealth test, is all to do with confirmation or renewal of our covenant with God. And it always ends in God's blessings. That's why I give you the verse for each one. It is out of his, it's a, it's a ending test. It's a test of attitude toward wealth. And uh, so if you find that in all these things you do not experience God's goodness, check yourself. Are you obeying His commandments? Are you doing it His ways? He, you are undergoing a hard test. Lastly, my third paragraph tells you that what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Our hearts face dangers when full. Or full, uh, when full, when our stomachs are full, when you live in fine houses, when you've got a good car, you have a good life, things are going fine. Watch out! Because you can be lifted up with pride. This is a problem. Don't say, I'm so humble. Uh, I once had a Bible study with a group of, uh, leading a Bible study group when I was in Singapore Poly as a student. And this guy came, he studied, we talked about humility. And at the end of the study, his conclusion, he said, guys, I want you to know this. I'm proud to tell you that I'm the humblest guy in this class. <laughs> I said, what? He said, I'm proud to tell you. I said, well, it's a... There's a contradiction. But uh, our hearts are faced this danger. The first danger is pride. That's why we are subject to pride test. The second danger that we face is when we say, my, my power, I able to do so many things because I'm so good. Well, that is the third danger is we forget the Lord. The Bible says we have stubborn, uh, and this here says stubborn obedience is still disobedience. All oh, this cartoon was put to me for me by my uh, secretary uh, in my office. That when we forget the Lord, don't ever forget the Lord. Then the third thing you, we we have to stop is what the habit of we must not stop. Uh, you see, when our hearts, when our stomachs are full, the danger is that we'll stop praising the Lord. We need to have the habit of blessing the Lord. And that's why we have to do it every Sunday morning when we get it together. Ungratefulness for God's grace is what comes. That's what verse 16 says. And you stop being grateful. You have stopped learning how to say thank you for every good thing God has given you. Then you end up following what? Other gods, including mammon, your self-created God. You follow other gods, worship other gods. When you stop worshipping the true God, you end up worshipping other gods. That will be for sure. Then lastly, what could go wrong? The end is destruction is assured. 
When we are lifted up in pride, we say, my power, when we forget the Lord, when we stop blessing the Lord, when we become ungrateful and we follow other gods, destruction is sure. That is what this whole passage says about. So when gift supersedes the giver, destruction awaits. Remember this. If you can remember the danger of your hearts, don't allow foolishness and darkness to come over your heart because this is exactly what will happen. And when that happens, you yourself can predict what will happen to you and your family forever. So God gives such wisdom in this passage. Let's bow our heads and respond. I've shown you three pictures. What is it that impresses you the most? I'd like you to now pick one thing that you want to covenant with the Lord as you acknowledge some good thing the Lord has given you. Can you acknowledge that it's the Lord who gives you the power to gain wealth, to gain the good thing? It's the Lord who gives you the power, not you. Can you think of one thing in your present family life? If you have, I just give you half a minute. Can you give a word of thanks to the Lord? Can you bless the Lord? Can you tell the Lord how you want to bless Him in the days ahead? Especially when the covenant renewal is due. You are the new generation. Very soon you'll be part of the old generation. Even though you are only a teenager. But you belong to the new generation. Are you making a covenant with the Lord right now. If you do so, tell Him. responded to the Lord, can you just stand so that I can make a closing prayer for you? Just stand and I'll pray. Father, we confess that in the past we have been guilty of ungratefulness because we failed to see that all wealth and all good things comes from, from you, Lord, the only source. Not because we are lucky. Not because we got good friends. Not because somebody opened door for us. That may be true, but that's subsidiary. It's you, Lord, who gives us the power to stay healthy, the power to get wealth, the power to do things and to behave uh, great health and everything we have enjoyed in the past Lord very often we have forgotten to give thanks and today Lord we repent of our sin and we recognize how evil and dark our hearts can become even though Lord your heart is so good to us and as we compare our own darkened hearts Lord today we covenant with you afresh to make the change that we'll always give glory to you. We'll always serve you with grateful hearts. We will not hold back our affection for you because you did not hold back your affection for us. So Lord, this day, help us, each one, as we pledge to obey all your commandments always, to reverence you with honor. And Lord, cause every one of our children as well to follow suit so that you'll be well with them forever. Thank you for this precious word that you have given us in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.